Well, welcome to the um, committee for San Diego Community Power meeting. Uh, my name is Andy Price and I'm the chair. Sebastian, you want to call off the roll? Yes, sir. Um, give me one second. Got a lot of screens opened up right now. Okay. Um, no particular order. Uh, uh, Gary Johns. Here, present. Anna Webb. Present. Ed Lopez. You're on mute, Ed. Thank you. Present. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Schofield. Present. Uh, Chair Price. Present. David Harris. Present. Uh, Matthew Vasilakis. Uh, present. Uh, Vice Chair Hammond. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Vice Chair Hammond. Present. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, you have all these board members, uh, committee members present, uh, but, but Tom Summers and Jen Dirks, let me check the attendees section uh, just to make sure. I think we're good. Uh, you do have quorum, Chair. Okay. Um, are there any public comments from the, any comments from the public? Uh, th there's no non-agenda public comments. Uh, we do have a public comment submitted for agenda item number nine. Uh, so, so, so we could get to it when we get to that item. Okay. Um, does anybody want to add, withdraw, or reorder the agenda? Everybody okay with the agenda as it is? Everybody looks like they're nodding their head yes, so I'll take that as a yes. Um, so I guess now uh, action, the first action item is approval of amendment to our regular meeting schedule. Uh, Sebastian, can you explain what that is and the dates and times, please? Yes, Chair. Um, if you recall at our uh, previous CAC meeting, um, we had talked about the desire to have these meetings uh, occur uh, earlier in the month so staff uh, could have more time to prepare items in case you wanted to send anything to uh, the Board of Directors. Uh, seeing as how this meeting right now is uh, less than a week before our regular board meetings, um, I uh, was in touch with all of you uh, to figure out a time that, that would work best. And based on the feedback from you all, um, uh, it seems like the consensus is the second Friday of the month at 1 p.m. Um, and and so, so that's the uh, proposed uh, time change chair um, and I can answer any questions uh, that anyone else may have um, If there's not any confusion or concern about that if somebody could make a motion we could actually vote on that and then that will be I make a motion simple. that we um, accept the proposed uh, change for meetings to the second Friday at 1 p.m. of the month Second. Anyone? I second the motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? I have a question. Who seconded? I'm taking notes. Carolyn Schofield. Okay, thank you. Great. I'll go ahead and uh, start with the roll call vote. Um, Gary Johns? Yes. Uh, Secretary Webb? Yes. Ed Lopez? Yes. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. David Harris? Yes. Matthew Vasilakis? Yes. Vice Chair Hammond? Yes. And Chair Price? Yes. 
Uh, thank you. This motion passes. Oh, seems like we have Jen on the line. Let me promote her to a panelist. Lower the hand first. Okay, we should be having her. Thank you. I, for some reason, wasn't able to join via the link in my invite, so I joined as a community participant. So I appreciate you adding me in as a panelist. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, that's an easy way for, yeah, and thank you for raising your hand uh, so I could promote you. Um, guess I, I can take your vote, Jen. Uh, do you vote in favor of uh, the revised meeting schedule? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, is there any way you could um, put up our draft work plan? Yes. Have it right here. You can see this, correct? Yeah. Okay, let me try to zoom in. Okay, awesome. Okay. So, so for this item, um, uh, uh, if I can begin, Chair, uh, you all saw an earlier ver version of this draft work plan last month. Um, one addition that we made, uh, thanks to Gary Johns uh, from Encinitas, uh, was to add a community member communications guide document uh, that staff is proposing to be completed uh, in the next several months. Um, for, for this, uh, we'll be bringing in Civilian, our mar marketing and communications firm, and uh, they're on the line. Uh, um, so, so we expect to come back uh, with something uh, next month. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update. Besides that, everything else is in there. Um, to recap, this, work plan, this draft work plan allows uh, you all flexibility to bring forward any items that are not currently there. Uh, as you all have done already, uh, and that staff is is appreciative for of. Um, so that's the gist of it. Uh, I can answer any more questions uh, if anyone else has them. Anybody have any questions? Um, so we're not really required to do anything, uh, Sebastian. So um, as, as we put it in the agenda, uh, we would want a vote from you all, uh, voting to recommend the board of directors to adopt this uh, next Thursday. So, so just a simple roll call vote um, to make sure that all of you are, are good with this version. Okay, uh, would anybody like to give a motion, make a motion? I move that we uh, recommend the board adopt uh, the, the work plan as presented. Second. Okay. Uh, Gary. Anybody want a second? I'll second. Okay, Sebastian, call the vote. Thank you. Uh, Gary Johns? Yes. Uh, Secretary Webb? Yes. Ed Lopez? Yes. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. David Harris? Yes. Matthew Vasilakis? Yes. Vice Chair Hammond? Yes. And Chair Price? Yepers. Awesome. Uh, and sorry, Jen, did I call you? No, but that's okay. No. Yes. Sorry. Let me go ahead and, and uh, change your name here because I, I see you as fourth creator. Oh, I'm sorry. I can go ahead. Yeah, I can change that. I, I can do it. Just do it right now. Um, and then while I'm at it, I'm Sean, are you okay if I change your name or if you want to change yours? Yeah, sorry about that. I'll do that right now. No worries. It's just so, so I because I see the names and then anyone watching, um, they know the names. 
Uh, great. Thank you all. Uh, this motion passes. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I got people putting up a fence and it looked kind of crooked, so I may have to exit here and talk crazy to some people and then come back. Um, okay. So are we done with that? Oops. Number six. So number seven, um, I'd like to introduce Agatha Wine, um, local government and community li liaison from the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, I think it's, you know, it's important that we, you know, hear from people and know these, these other industry specific um, entities that have a input on what we do on the CCA. So without any further ado, um, Agatha. Thank you so much, Chair Price. Um, is my audio okay? Everything? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, taking time in your agenda for, uh, for me to just give you a little introduction today. Um, <clears throat> I was attending um, uh, one of your meetings, I don't know if it was last month or the month before, and um, I, you know, this is one of those moments where Zoom just uh, doesn't really fulfill a meeting in the same room because I was listening to you guys um, kind of have a conversation about what the best way to engage with the CPUC was. And I, I had the thought, you know, if I was in the room, I would have jumped up and raised my hand and introduced myself then. Um, but so I reached out to Chair Price and, and here I am. Um, so my goal today, I am, uh, I uh, am your local government and community liaison at the CPUC. And um, I, my goal today is just to introduce myself to you and um, make you aware that I'm here as a resource for you. Um, are you doing the slides, Sebastian? Or do I do them? Okay, perfect, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I'll, um, so um, the CPUC, I know that this group um, is pretty savvy um, out there in the energy world. So I know that you've heard of the CPUC before. Um, but uh, it's likely that our reach is a little broader and deeper, I think, than most people realize. So I just wanted to articulate kind of um, the role we play in California. We regulate electric and natural gas service, as you know, um, SDG&E. We also regulate portions of the telecommunications industry, although that's shared with uh, the federal government, FCC. Um, privately held water companies, which um, are in a lot of small towns across the state. Um, we regulate rail safety. So we work with local governments often on rail crossings and um, rail safety, rail transit. So talking to Sandag and people like that, NCTD a lot. And also, um, as was, uh, was a lot, there was a lot of CPUC, CPUC adjacent news of uh, this week. Week, but one of those um, was also TNCs uh, or transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. So um, the the topic that was in the uh, the news was really a legal battle. We sit on the regulatory side, so that wasn't quite in our lane. But um, I wanted to mention it. Um, okay, next slide, please. So. Um, we have, at the PUC, uh, we have eight local government and community liaisons that cover the state. So um, it's not very many. Uh, <laughs> a lot of us, if you look at these territories, especially my colleague up north, um, we cover a lot of ground. Um, but it's more than we've had before, so we're excited about um, kind of just increases in our outreach capabilities. Um, so my territory is down here circled in the in the corner. Um, I live here in San Diego and uh, I work with Orange County, San Diego County and Imperial County communities. Um, three very different places and uh, it's really never a dull moment. Um, so uh, the CPUC is headquartered in San Francisco, although, um, you know, we're all over the place these days. 
Um, we do, our closest office is in Los Angeles, but I am local here in San Diego. If you can't hear by uh, the plane noise behind me. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so the role of the outreach liaison um, is pretty much moments exactly like this one. Um, so you guys are a community advisory group. I know some of you, um, but I'm sure all of you are involved in community organizations or community efforts um, in your individual cities or communities. Um, and you're here to advise uh, San Diego community power on sort of how best to serve you, which is great. So um, we work with, my role is really a two-way role. So a lot of times I am sending out press releases on new decisions or new policies coming out of the CPUC. Um, but a lot of times I am taking meetings where I'm listening to either staff or elected officials talk to me about what's not working um, in their community, kind of how state policy is, um, is not exactly working correctly on the ground for them. So, um, and I bring that information back to the CPUC and um, try to insert it where it can be helpful. Um, so some of the types of organizations that um, the liaisons work with, community advisory groups um, like you guys, uh, community-based organizations, elected officials, city and county agencies, that would include public works, um, emergency operations, um, Regional government uh, bodies, SANDAG, the Port, San Diego County Water Authority. Um, you know, the thing about energy and especially electricity is everybody's got, you know, particularly as our electric systems become more advanced and more complex, everybody's got a little piece of it and everybody's got um, an interest. So we are here to work with anybody who our policy impacts. Um, local businesses, chambers of commerce, and diverse organizations. Um, so yeah, so, and next slide, please. Um, there are back to, and then here are some of the, the places that we intersect with local government. Um, so CCAs, which is why we're all here today. Um, CPUC um, does not regulate CCAs, but we do regulate the utilities that are involved in the CCA partnerships. Um, so, and then sometimes that really feels like we're regulating CCAs. So, um, there, yeah, which is a, a subject we could talk about for a long time, I'm sure. Um, but uh, so that's our role there is, um, it is, it changes as well. Um, but that one you're familiar with. Um, public safety power shut off. So um, we know that this policy is um, needs sort of con continuous improvement. Um, SDG&E is really um, certainly, I don't know if you guys know this, but they really are looked to as the model um, in the state, particularly on this policy. They've been um, figured out a way to make public safety power shut offs um, as least disruptive as possible and they're constantly um, improving that so obviously that's a concern for local governments so we talk a lot about that issue and wildfire safety of course and preparedness um, rail crossings and rail safety utility line undergrounding programs um, and then of course sdg &E has a number of pilot programs um, around that are uh, a lot of government agencies are involved with. So EV charging infrastructure at the port or pumped water storage programs at the water authority. Um, so these are a lot of places that we overlap or our, in our policies impact local governments and what's happening in real life in communities. Um, next slide, please. So, um, this is about it for me. I, I do the, you know, the question is, okay, great, you're here, um, but how do we get involved or what is the potential relationship here um, for the CCA and the, and the CPUC? Um, so the, the CPUC is a, is a, it's run by lawyers. 
<laughs> I don't know how many lawyers are on this committee, um, but I, as a regular, it's a regulatory body that's over a hundred years old, and our organization functions as such. Sometimes it can be hard to find the right person or understand exactly what stage something might be in at the CPUC, and there are. I wish I could tell you that everybody's input is considered equally all the time, but that is not the reality of the regulatory process. So when you do have input or you do have something to say to the PUC, it does matter when you say it, um, you know, at what stage of a process your input comes in and how you say it. And so, um, there are sort of three different levels of involvement or levels of commitment to that process. And the highest one is becoming a party to a proceeding. Um, you guys may or may not, I don't want to make assumptions, but you may or may not be represented or, or consider yourselves represented by Cal CCA. Um, they are a frequent party to proceedings. So they, um, you know, they get involved in that really heavy, a heavy, intense, kind of time-consuming way. Um, there, you can also file formal complaints against a regulated entity. When you become a party to a proceeding, you've got to really do certain things at certain times. Um, but you're very involved in the process and your input is heavily considered. Um, you can file a formal complaint against a utility at any time. Um, and you can also submit formal comments either on proceedings that you're not a party to or on staff reports and proposals as they come up. Um, it's hard to catch these things at the right time. I will tell you that even I have a hard time following all the proceedings I'm interested in and knowing exactly what stage they're in. Um, one of the meetings I attended, you guys um, got a readout from Ty, uh, Ty Tazdal. I, I don't know if he is an advisor to you directly or simply if you heard from him through his role um, with the greater um, SDCP. But um, uh, uh, he is. Uh, oh. uh, he's, yeah, he's a, he's a, a regulatory counsel. Um, Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So Ty, I have crossed paths with Ty um, a lot and he I believe as his, uh, his job is to tell you when to get involved, <laughs> right? Is to follow these things for you and kind of let you know what's going on and where you can be uh, impactful or, or if you want to get involved with something at the PUC. But um, I know that between Ty and of course, Cody Hooven um, and Chair Price, who's also got um, a you know, longer, long relationship with the PUC, these folks are all very familiar familiar with our, um, you know, the 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 pros and cons. Um, I think they know kind of how, certainly how to get things done at the PUC. So um, they are great um, sources of information too on these things. So I know I know I went over that last part kind of quickly, but um, I don't want to take up too much more time, and I. If there are questions, I wanted to leave time for that as well. So that's about it for me. There is one more slide with my contact info. Hi, Agatha. This is Cody. I'm, I'm on. I was kind of just listening in the background. I'm going to chime in really quick if that's okay with you all. Um, thanks for coming here and introducing yourself to our community advisory committee. That's um, a great connection and awareness for them to have. <clears throat> I just want to chime in because it's something that I I've been noticing more and more that now that we're a formed CCA, this is really the benefit. Um, let me rephrase that. This is one of the benefits of forming a CCA is um, in the past, typically, you know, each individual local government would have to try to engage in the CPC process for their individual actions. And then there's some, you know, advocate groups and Ed could speak to that, <laughs> you know, the, the level of work it takes to engage in this process. Um, I'm really seeing it's more of a side benefit or co-benefit of having a CCA form that's that's joint and that's representing multiple cities and more kind of has a regional approach to things. Um, it's a benefit to us as ratepayers because we actually 
have the resources now to spend the time and effort to dig into these proceedings and engage where appropriate. Um, there's no way that each individual local government would be able to hire a Ty Tosdall type attorney, and we actually have multiple attorneys on board just to help us engage in this very, I guess I put it nicely, it's a crazy opaque process that you have to basically have teams of attorneys, which is really expensive um, to engage in. So it's, it's definitely one of them. I don't know, just something I've been thinking about and it's a, taking a step back for a minute. It's something I just wanted you all to, to know that that's, you know, another side benefit of having a, a regional um, agency like this is we can help daylight some of those things and advocate for us. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Agatha. Um, does anybody else have any questions for um, Agatha? I do, Chair Price, if you didn't mind. Please, thank you. Uh, Agatha, thank you for uh, joining and presenting us today. And um, just more of a general type question, certainly don't mean to put you on the spot either. Is there any update you perhaps can share in terms of the commission and the other regulatory bodies um, doing some post-mortem review of the recent uh, rolling blackout events? You went, you went right there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, this is a great question. Um, I do not, I read the same news articles you guys did about it. Um, so I don't have any insider info. I do know that, um, you know, the California independent system operator, the CAISO is, uh, I, I heard, you know, there was some sort of cross finger pointing, I think earlier this week, um, on those issues. Um, I know that they're going to, I know it'll be looked at. I mean, no no governor wants to be in that seat uh, during another energy or electricity issue. So um, I know they'll look into it and I feel pretty confident that the governor will let us know what we need to do in the future to avoid um, that situation again. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. How, how, how would a relationship with you be beneficial to the CCA down here? Very good question, Chair Price. It depends on what your goals are. I know that I benefit, um, I benefit from keeping in touch with you guys so I know kind of what's going on on the ground and I can be helpful to my colleagues at the PUC and keep them apprised of, um, you know, any significant happenings or just kind of be an information source for them. Um, but um, it's based on your goals. So, you know, if you guys want to be really communicative with the PUC, I'm here to help you do that. Um, if you just want to stay informed about what's happening at the PUC, I can also help you do that. Okay. Do you have anything to do with the... Um Exit fee? Um, me personally, no. Um, but are you talking PCIA? Yes, ma'am. Um, That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, the CPUC is the entity that determines the PCIA and how okay. it is. Well, I think the first message we may like to send to the PUC via you is um, be nice. You know, we don't, we, uh, the, the J San Diego Community Power doesn't have 100 year relationships with the PUC, right? We're just beginning a relationship. So um, it's going to be very difficult for our voice to really be significantly heard um, as a community voice. So, you know, I, I, I just wanted to add that. I appreciate. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> I um, appreciate. I appreciate the sentiment. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, just chair Pies, I don't know if if you can see all the screens. Um, Tara has a couple of questions in addition to Gary Johns. Just wanted to point that out to you. Okay, I can't see all the screens, but um, co-chair Hammond, please. So I, I had two similar thoughts as Eddie. The first, thank you, Agatha. It's nice to meet you. Appreciate you being here and being a resource for us. Um, I do think it would be great 
depending on your bandwidth, to bring forward information to us. I know a lot of us are tracking these different issues. Um, it seems with the three investor and utilities, one of them is always making different um, filings that negatively impact how community choice energy operates via solar or something related to that. So it would be very much appreciated for you to help us uh, stay apprised to those issues. And even though it's my understanding that San Diego Community Power is a member of Cal CCA and they, in addition to Ty, are working on it. Um, but that would be my request if that's possible. And then Teddy's second point was also in my mind, I uh, spent the previous nine years in the solar industry and you seem very helpful and like you genuinely care, but our relationship with the CPUC has been watching the utilities attack solar, often getting their way, having cl closed door meetings, decisions made before we even spend hours waiting at the CPUC to speak. And so I just wanna be, I feel like that's an important thing to bring up um, and see if you have any tips from us. That 100 year old model is so intertwined with the utilities. Utility executives go to work at the CPUC, CPUC then, also has executives who go work for the utilities, violating different rules, getting paid millions of dollars and having terrible deals. And that scares me for SDCP success that the utilities will continue to undermine rooftop solar. They will attack uh, climate justice efforts and those will prevent San Diego community power from reaching its goals, from hitting 100% clean energy, from having funds to do community programs. So my question is how can we work with you how can we navigate this very complex, some would say bought off system that um, can be very frustrating and feel like our voice isn't heard? Um, how do we continue to make progress to try to have our community goals met? I'm not sure if I have an answer, a specific answer uh, is a big thing. I think that, um, I think that, that being here and ha being, a part of, being a part of this meeting is sort of like a good first step um, or, you know, hopefully second or third step. Um, I think that the, you know, the P, I like to say, Eddie's probably heard me say this before, the, the PUC is not a sentient being right it's run by five commissioners and those five commissioners are rotating so um i like to be i am personally more optimistic about the puc's future reputation and future actions um than i i'd like to i'd like to think it has a brighter future than it has pa a past uh is maybe a better way to put it um I, I've been in with the PUC two and a half years. Um, everybody I've worked for in that time, I've had a lot of respect for. Um, I've also heard a lot of stories from colleagues who've been around a long time about past leadership and um, that were, you know, unbecoming. Um, so I, I meet a lot of people who express a lot of frustration about the PUC and I understand it. I am certainly not here to say it's unfounded um, or that your skepticism and kind of, you know, trust but verify or maybe not even that, um, you know, is warranted. So I'm here to help build the relationship. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do that the best that I can. Um, I'm not a commissioner. So I don't, I can't make, I can't promise you that the right decisions are going to get made or that, um, you know, things are always going to go. I can definitely promise you they're not always going to go your way. Cause I think that's the regulatory world, but, um, but I can't make promises beyond that, but I am here to build the relationship. Okay. So. I appreciate that. I'm not, I, my frustration is definitely not trying to attack you. I know it's not you. you know, I'm either competing starting next week. I'm concerned about that. Um, we've just seen the utilities trying to undermine solar and, they pretend they care about the most vulnerable communities, but their actions say otherwise. And it's this really dirty political game um, that rate payers end up taking uh, the, you know, they, they end up being negatively impacted by it. So any tips from you on how to navigate to try to get us to meet our goals 
um, at any time is very, very much welcome. Sounds good. No, I appreciate it. I think that the PUC will only um, be as accountable as uh, the folks who hold it accountable require it to be. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sebastian, you said there was somebody else that had a question? Yeah, yeah the, Eddie, that's me, Gary Johns. Um, okay, hey, Gary. <laughs> I think uh, you and Kara really covered, uh, I think, uh, basically most of the points that uh, I also wanted to make. I wanted to start by saying that the, the PCIA is the elephant in the room here. And uh, so in terms, uh, Agatha, Agatha, something you can do for us, it would be good to have a really detailed update of just where things stand. Um, I was quite amazed to learn that there was a decision uh, less than two weeks ago, right? Or yeah, le uh, about two weeks ago about the uh, prepayment of uh, PCIA fees. And of course, I, you know, there's been all kinds of filings and even decisions since the October 2018 decision uh, that uh, I think was really a watershed moment in terms of you know, frustration, the frustration that uh, Tara speaks to. So I just hope that, uh, you know, in your role, uh, the feedback to us, especially about that issue, the uh is one that uh, you'll take to heart. Yeah, I think, um, Gary, I liked your suggestion about, um, about maybe getting an update um, because some of the, uh, there are some specific, there, just like everything else, um, there are some kind of um, sdg and &E territory specifics about the uh, PCIA and it, it might be, I know that, I know the PUC has given some presentation, uh, probably our last presentations on the subject that we gave were during um, the time when SDCP was not yet formed, when we were still, you were still contemplating kind of forming the CCA. So. Um, now probably is a good time um, for my colleagues to uh, update you and maybe I can maybe I can let them know that uh, in this meeting it came up and that uh, you guys have requested um, information. I don't know if you're interested in a presentation or or from one of my colleagues or me or, or what have you but um, I'd be happy to send that request forward because maybe yep. you guys can Sorry, go ahead. Oh, maybe you guys, um, because I know that the questions that you're going to want to dive into are going to be more above my pay grade, um, right? I'm, I'm a mile wide and an inch deep at the PUC, so um, rather than being super in-depth on PCIA. So um, I'd be happy to send forward that request for you. Um, if, I could, if I can chime in, um, uh, thank you, Agatha, for mentioning this, but uh, if I can bring our community advisory committee uh, back to last month when we had Ty uh, give a presentation. Um, as, as, as we know, he's our regulatory counsel, and so he is, him and his team are part of these proceedings. He is, I don't know what you're saying was, Agatha, he is one inch wide by like 10 miles deep in, into all of this. And so um, I can work with Chair Price uh, to see if, if there's appetite or or we can determine if there's appetite to come back next month uh, for Ty to present that that briefing, and then um, just because I, I think since he's been part of it, um, uh, it'd be it'd be a little bit more more fruitful. Um, but we can definitely bring in Agatha if if that's the desire of this committee. Just wanted to chime in on that. Uh, yeah, well, as uh, Sebastian, as far as our internal work, I, I think, uh, yes, if, if we do it internally that way, uh, th that would be, you know, more, uh, more than sufficient. But I think it's also important, especially uh, uh, for Agatha to take back uh, the frustration such as Tara expressed because uh, some of these past actions have, uh, I'll say, made us uh, not, not feeling trust. You know, and I'd like to add, I've been trying to figure out a nice way to say this, so hopefully this will come out nice. Um, 
but there is there is systematic racism, right? Which mainly affects black people and people of color. There's also systematic oppression, which affects everybody, right? And you're in an entity that has been known to oppress communities that it says it serves, right? Because of your, in my humble opinion, because of your hundred year relationship with um, the big utilities. So, you know, I would just invite you to kind of look out for, you know, while you're doing your thing two inches deep and a mile wide, you know, see if you can see some of those oppressive tickle points, right? And, uh, you know, not for us, but maybe for your own education. You know, it's like, okay, I'm in this behemoth. How does this really operate? Why do they do that? You know, anytime somebody tells me that this is the way we've always done it, that's a clue that it, that needs to change, right? So anyhow, anybody else have any questions? Thank you, Agatha. Thank you all Thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to uh, civilian now, correct? Yes, um, uh, I'm pretty excited about this item. Uh, we have been having lots of conversations with civilian and in, in um, uh, 360. They'll, they'll introduce themselves more, but uh, uh, as many of you know, I came from the advocacy world. And so uh, uh, to learn from all of you um, on how community choice has emerged, uh, that's what they're here for. Uh, but I don't want to take their, sh their spotlight away. I'm just excited about it. Just want to express it. So, so, so go ahead, Sean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear me? Am I coming through okay? All right. It's not. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks for letting us join uh, your, your monthly meeting. Um, as, as Sebastian mentioned, um, we're, we're actively getting up to speed in a sector that, um, you know, you, you've, been, you've been fighting this fight a long time and, and you've been passionate and you've been vocal and you're a lot of the reason that San Diego Community Power exists. So um, as part of our initial research that will eventually lead into marketing, uh, messaging, communications, um, we're in the process of going through discovery right now. And, and you know, when, when Sebastian and Cody and the team offered us a chance to come and, and speak with you, um, we wanted to jump at that because um, I want to spend the next few minutes uh, listening, actively listening as much as possible. Um, we, we recognize the, the power of the advocates and, and our job here as marketers is to figure out how to take, um, how to take the, the core messages and make them very consumer friendly, but don't uh, have as much of a commitment to it as you do and, and as your teams do. Um, so our, our job is partial, partially translating that. Um, so if we want to go on to the next slide, um, Sebastian, just quickly introduce um, our team, and then I'll let, I'll let Greg introduce 360 as well. Um, at Civilian, we are a local base. We're a San Diego company. We're a social change marketing agency. Um, we're fully integrated, so, so we handle um, everything under the sun when it comes to marketing and advertising. Coincidentally, we are doing everything under the sun with San Diego Community Power. They're, they're taking advantage of every single capability that we can scrape from the barrel, which is great. Um, uh, Aside from general um, advertising, you know, web design development, uh, marketing, all that, um, what we've also picked up in, in the past couple of years is really the power of community outreach and, and joining meetings like this. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, MTS's Elevate SD outreach program um, that happened over the past couple of years. That was a project we were intimately involved with, and they had they had a community advisory committee. It was sixty people, and it was so beneficial for that organization, um, not only in creating a dialogue, a two-way dialogue, but also um, as they went through their planning process, recommendations from the CAC found, its, found their way frequently into, into their project plans. Um, so we know that this isn't just uh, lip service. This isn't just building a relationship um, for the sake of a relationship. It's, uh, it's really beneficial. Um, and, and just thank you, for, thank you for your time that you spent through the years and now, and, um, and we're just hoping to uh, learn as much as we can um, today. Uh, Greg, did you want to talk about 360? Sure, I'll just I'll be brief. We're a, we're a local San Diego-based public affairs firm. Um, work on a lot of different types of issues, everything from 
land use to campaigns to working with uh, different government agencies and quasi government agencies on, you know, all their various needs, um, dealing with communities, dealing with governments, um, government decisions. Um, so our role in, in uh, working with San Diego Community Power is really to be, quite frankly, it's a lot what, what Agatha was doing. Um, it's to be a liaison for the organization to all the various government agencies in town, um, elected officials, uh, civic and business organizations, community-based organizations, um, really be um, eyes and ears out there for the organization to come back and say, hey, this is what you know, this legislator is thinking. Um, and, and working with you all and other advocates, as Sean was saying, to, to really um, get out there and, and get the message out there and build our, our coalition of people who are supportive and, and making sure that we're successful. That's it. Great. We can keep rolling, Sebastian. Um, promise that the, the civilian talking point of the presentation is going to end pretty quickly so we can get to the listening part. But we just want to give you a quick summary of all the efforts that are underway right now as they roll out in the next several months. Um, we can go to the roadmap slide itself. Um, so we are finishing up our discovery process right now and we're moving into what, what's, what we term as brand identity. So um, we have a great name, a powerful name, Sending Community Power. What does that look like? How does it express itself? What is its color palette? What does its logo look like? Um, what type of photography, graphic elements, things like that? That's all things that we want to establish as soon as possible because more and more as we get closer to the customer rollout in March 2021 and beyond, um, we want to set all these up ahead of time so that it's a very smooth rollout um, for the staff. Um, we also are, are focusing on messaging. So uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is messaging. Um, so I'll get into that shortly. Uh, we are building a website. Um, we are doing inventory analysis and figuring out what our outreach strategies will be for all of the stakeholder groups, similar to, to what Greg mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, media relations, PR is gonna be huge. We know that the, that the headlines, if you don't proactively uh, inform media, then they'll take a story uh, in sometimes an uninformed place that you don't want it to be. So we wanna get out ahead of that as much as humanly possible. Um, we also have, of course, the customer notifications. So assuming that we're, you know, we're moving forward and we're, and we're looking at a, a municipal rollout in March, we wanna make sure that we get those notifications out and that we think, well, we think thoughtfully <laughs> about how we, how we um, message those notifications, what type of information is on them. If somebody gets a direct mail piece, uh, what, what do we want their impression to be? How do we want to give them enough information so that they won't opt out? And then maybe in the future, they'll consider opting up. Um, so that's just kind of the things that we think about there. And then we've got the municipal rollout. And this, this timeline extends all the way through June of 2021. And of course, uh, into the big show, the residential uh, play in January of 2022. Um, but for today, um, the next slide, we're just going to really um, take this as an input session. Um, we are doing a lot of upfront research right now. We're doing some consumer surveys, um, but also again, like I mentioned earlier, we really wanna take advantage of, of your background, your expertise and your passion um, to help inform you know, a message matrix that my associate Kim is putting together or um, you know, different stakeholder grids that Greg and his team are gonna be putting together. So um, that's basically the end of the spiel. Um, are there any questions before we get to the, the workshop part of our little meeting today? All right, so from here on out, um, we're gonna put everyone to work and we know that you're not shy people, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. Um, but if we can move to the next slide, Sebastian, excuse me, um, objectives. So there are obviously um, business and energy-based objectives, but if we could put a, a, a lens on right now to really just think about marketing communications, um, we wanna hear from you as to what you feel the objectives or what you want to see out of marketing communications for San Diego community power. Um, the reason this image is, uh, is multiple targets at different depths is you have different objectives for different audiences and you also have long-term, mid-term and, and far-term objectives. So um, we'd just love to hear from this group if anyone has wants to offer up um, what's important to you and what are your objectives from a communication standpoint for community power. Um, if I may speak, uh, this is Gary Johns. I represent Encinitas, one of the uh, smaller cities. Uh, th this community advisory uh, committee that we're on, our, I think our objectives are not quite the same as SDCP. My main concern is that since I represent the citizens of Encinitas, how do they know to come to me to find out or, you know, 
lodge a complaint or, or whatever, or provide input. Um, we're supposed to be a two-way uh, communications type of function here. So that's a little bit different than some of the energy, uh, you know, specific energy considerations for SDCP. And, and I'll just piggyback and say that's the same concerns that Tom and I have from Imperial Beach, you know, is how do we gather that information from the community to bring it back in a successful way. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and I think some of the information that we'll be pulling together in that community members uh, communication guide, I think that'll hopefully give you some channels and some recommendations as to how to, how to bring that information in. And then also um, just, you know, thoughts and tips on how to, how to, how to represent cons in a consumer friendly way, how to explain community choice energy to folks. So um, that's a really great because, you know, when we, when we create this guideline, it could be very message based or it could also include um, structures and channels and, and, and that type of thing, which sounds like what you're, what you're hoping for as well. So we'll make sure we include that type of information. Yeah, I would, I would emphasize structures and channels over, uh, I mean, well, certainly messaging is that how, how you say it but uh, the structures and channels is a uh, prime interest of mine. Got it. What else? I think um, ensuring that our opt-out rate is not too high is crucial. I helped fight for community choice energy for eight and a half years and sdg &E owned by Sempra. Sempra seemed to be the only um, one that was opposing this. They filed as you probably know, um, a petition to the CPUC asking to legally oppose community choice energy. So they created Semper Services. They held press conferences next to our big coalition of climate justice advocates fighting for this um, with mismessaging. And they called it Clear the Air. They had a social media campaign and they were very much trying to make people fearful of community choice energy. After that, the city of San Diego had issues billing 10% of customers with their water bills. And I've seen ads and people commenting on social media saying, well, the city couldn't even bill for water. Now they're trying to bill for your electricity. And so why the opt-out rate is so important is we want to have better buying power. We want to have more revenue to have these awesome community-based programs. And if people are opting out because they SDG and scared them and Sempra scared them away, or they have the misconception that the billing is going to be drastically different, like the city's water department, um, that's a fear of mine. So messaging to address um, those would be uh, a priority to me. That's great. That's I mean, obviously, we yeah, we are aware of the of the that historical campaign to clear the air. And, and one thing that we want to do in some of our upfront consumer surveys is really get a sense as to what level of awareness community choice energy has in the general public, whether it's residential customers or, or commercial um, uh, decision makers, right, for, the, for those bigger accounts. Um, but also, you know, for people that are aware of the Clear the Air campaign, or they may have some mis-messaging that's still in the back of their head from a couple of years ago, um, what type of messaging will help them think about things differently? Um, that's something that we're looking to learn pretty quickly as well. Um, personally, I'd like to see um, the term communities of concern woven into whatever the marketing is. Um, you know, we, we, we will have to work with the other cities to help them identify um, their communities of concern um, so that we can shoot, you know, guide benefits of the CCA um, in an equitable process to those communities of concern. But I think it's very important that communities of concern understand that this will be beneficial for them also. And, um, you know, trying in, in identifying what those benefits will be. Great. Thank you. With no, absolutely no, this is merely my humble opinion and not the opinion of the board, but um, absolutely no identification like minority or disadvantaged or low income or none of those derogatory negative terms. Got it. Anything else? 
I think from a marketing and messaging standpoint, and hi, Sean, good to see you. It's been a good long time. Good to see you, Jen. I, I was going to message you, but it's locked, yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think from a marketing and messaging standpoint, you know, this isn't a new and crazy and leftist idea to have right. community choice power. And I think I want to make sure that we, you know, point to some of the other great case studies in the state um, that have done this successfully. And, and also the fact that this is a joint effort by multiple communities here in San Diego, you know, it's a joint power authority. And I think showing the progress that has been made to date to even form this and giving it that credibility and, and making sure that the public doesn't see this as, you know, a grassroots movement of a bunch of very passionate people that they're maybe not sure about. So that credibility factor for me is, is important. Great. Yeah. I mean, we're going to get one shot at this, right? So we, right. we roll it out. Yeah. Any other objectives, any other thoughts? Um, just something that I, I recently had found out, one of my um, colleagues was researching other CCE programs and I have a very hard time finding bilingual um, Spanish materials. Um, I think they found like a few examples at Clean Power Alliance, but it was very weak. He's a native speaker and was just like, it's really botched. <laughs> um, so I think that, that there definitely should be opportunities for there to be more bilingual um, marketing. Uh, and I, I don't know what the predominant languages are in the county, but, you know, more than just Spanish, but also, you know, other communities as well. And then um, I think objectively too, one of the important things about the, the marketing thing for me is that we want STCP to expand into other cities. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of communities that can benefit from clean power, um, from a community choice energy program. And I think that um, you know, just being conscientious of, and you have this in your slide deck about how we talk to elected officials and decision makers um, about why this is important, because ultimately, um, you know, we would like to have a, a, a larger program <laughs> that more people on board. Um, so that's something that I'm also thinking about. And just in general, like uh, something that we saw, and just as a bit of background, like I did a lot of the advocacy uh, prior to this. Um, a lot of folks really resonate with the idea of community and community focus and community choice. And so there are a lot of benefits, but I think connecting folks directly via the community argument has been highly effective. And so that can be an area where you just scope out and, and think, um, uh, you know, like how to move forward on that. But that's, that's my feedback. And I appreciate uh, Sean and <clears throat> Greg for being here and, and working with us on Terrific. that. Terrific. If I may, I'd simply like to add, um, and to start with, I think all the, the points made by the uh, everybody else before sort of to look at your uh, a slide are on target. And, uh, um, but as we go forth in terms of marketing and, and communication, including outreach, uh, the messaging, I would just perhaps note or, or stress, um, you know, let's be careful and considerate of the overall expectation I don't know if it's per se managing the expert expectation, uh, but let's, you know, it's, as was said, I think CCAs are not radical uh, organizations or movements, but progressive. It's about uh, moving forth and having um, uh, enterprises that deliver fundamental services have more than just a bottom fiscal line, but have a social consideration as well. And SDCA would, is a choice. It provides for local communities to give voice to that choice as to whether there should be more community-oriented programs. I don't think anybody's saying, you know, let's, let's go to extreme hyperbole with uh, cost savings, for example, that may yield or inert over the long run. But we just want to make sure that certainly that is an objective, but we want to manage that because uh, we're not quite sure perhaps at the moment, what those exact financial or fiscal savings uh, or the magnitude of it will be. Again, it's just a question as we take all of this into the framework of messaging and communication. Let's be, let's be try to moderate perhaps in the expectations and uh, certainly we can always uh, uh, over deliver on more appropriate uh, promises. A, that's a really great point. Thank you for, for making it. And, and you know, when you're in a, a startup environment, when you're when you're going on your your on ramp or your as, as this group is right now, um, it's really important to to diversify the benefits that you provide between the rational and the emotional. Um, like we're when we do our messaging, we're not going to come out with 
15 minutes could save you 15%, right? It's not a single benefit um, because a lot of these things, you know, they, they, t- they tend to fluctuate over time. Um, so we're going to look at the right balance of, of how we can have, you know, several pegs to that message and, and several, several different um, key points that we want to, that we want to pull on based on who we're talking to, where we're talking to them and, and what we wanted them to do. And that's the other interesting part of this and kind of where, where we really love the opportunity for all, aside from all the other reasons is for us as marketers, conversion means we want somebody to do something. We want them to buy something. We want them to go to a website. We want them to subscribe to a YouTube channel. Uh, in this case, as we're getting off the ground, conversion is inaction in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we, we, we want to decrease opt-outs first and foremost, like the, the very, the very black and white school that we have here is, is the, to, to mitigate opt-outs. So that's just an interesting marketing challenge. And you want to find the right amount of information to inspire confidence and build that credibility we were talking about earlier. Um, but not go so far as to get people to get so engaged that they might consider opting out. So it's just a really interesting dynamic. Um, I, I just wanted to let Chair Price know, uh, uh, Carolyn has her hand raised um, in case you hadn't seen her screen. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make a comment in our community that I often ran into a lot of allegiance to SDG and E and would have to do a lot of reassurance that this is a partnership. And I changed a lot of my um, messaging when I was speaking to people. And especially right now because of jobs and job concerns. And so people really worry about, oh no, you know, someone know, everyone knows, seems to know someone, either friend or family who works for SDG and and they're already nervous. And so that's, um, that's a concern that I would want to bring up as far as messaging goes. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, why don't we keep moving unless there anyone else had any final objectives? Great. Um, so kind of our, 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 our currency when we build a brand and, and I know Jen's probably smirking over there cause this is her, this is her, her process as well in a lot of ways is we try to identify brand attributes. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Sebastian, um, this is a, a series of terms and characteristics that identify the core essence of your brand. And when I say terms, I really mean in terms, words, you know, three, three to five, or maybe even seven in some cases, individual words that when you bring them all together, it paints a picture of what your brand is. Um, so I thought it'd be really great with this group to do a brand attribute exercise. Um, it's very simple. I'm going to ask each of you to take five minutes. If, if we're all done earlier, then great. Um, let's take a couple minutes and just do me a favor and write down three to five individual words. It's not a sentence. It's individual terms, adjectives to describe what you feel the right uh, brand for San Diego Community, Community Power um, would be to the, in, in, in this market to these customers. Are there any, any questions on that? Am I, am I clear enough or do you want to start, start writing? Okay, let's go ahead.
Maybe I should have turned my music back on for this little <laughs> quiet time we have here. Usual Jeopardy soundtrack? Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if folks are finished, if you wouldn't mind just looking up so I can keep track, but no problem if you're still working. How about if we all raise our hand um, and then kind of like that, and then we can see who has uh, finished. I think Gary wants to raise the blue hand, the white blue hand. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to wait wait he wants to do what he, i didn't get that either sebastian ex explain what a blue hand is i don't know what that is no it it's it's the white hand with the blue background that uh caroline anna and eddie have up and then you just did like I don't know. It well, was he funny. He basically I... raised his hand like that. <laughs> <You're really>? Yeah. <laughs> where's, the, where's the blue hand on my on my Zoom? There's no blue hand on my Zoom thing to do it. Yeah, if you go down to the bottom where it says participants and click on that. Oh, there it is. There Thank you, Eddie. You, You're welcome. <laughs> and a lot of folks looking up, I think. I think we're cool. Why don't we just go ahead and get started? I, I think at this point Gary has to go first. <laughs> then you kick us off. <laughs> okay. So uh, you know, I think you're looking for like um, a single word or a like two, maybe three word phrase. And everything I came up with is like not a full sentence, but longer. But That's probably slow. okay. So let me just start. It all helps. Right. Local control of electricity rates is my first one. Rein, reinvestment of electric bill dollars in our community. And then the third one is in the spirit, green electricity. Terrific, thank you. I'm taking notes and, and writing down themes as we go through it, so pardon my, my not making eye contact. Uh, who's up next? Uh, I can go. Um, I have community, equitable, and generational. Terrific. Any other volunteers? I can go next. I have 100% um, clean energy choice, affordable, and transparent. Good. I'll, I'll go next. I had community-based or community trust, local benefits, sustainable, equitable future, and choice. Can I ask you to repeat that again, please? I'm, I'm taking notes for this meeting. <laughs> I missed a couple. Community? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Community-based trust, local benefits, sustainable, equitable future, and choice. Thank you. I can go next. Um, I have uh, balanced, human-centered or human-first, um, future-focused, opportunistic, and uplifting when I think about personality traits. I want this to be um, an optimistic messaging platform. Terrific. Jen, how many times are you on the receiving end of these exercises? <laughs> Very fun to be on the other side. I enjoy it. <laughs> um, um, next, uh, I also thought future-oriented, uh, like Jen. Um, responsive to consumer needs, reliability. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, I had also choice and I also had community. I have partnerships, alternatives, 
and environmentally responsible. Right. As to what I had, I came up with pairs of words, figuring I'd probably be using words that others already said. Uh, community inclusive, that was one pair. Progressive, clean, another pair. And choice and control. All right. Um. So for mine, I have uh, community focused, fair partner, good neighbors, 100% clean energy, good jobs, public power, and exciting future. Can I strong second the good neighbor comment? Thank you, Matthew, for that. It's beautiful. Matthew, what was your last one? I had public power. I lost your last one. Exciting future. Exciting future. Thank you. Does anyone else have some suggestions? We have Tom. Hey, Tom. Welcome. And then we have Anna with hands raised. Tom, if you wanna go ahead. Let me un unmute you, you're muted. Let's see. There you go. Yeah, hi everybody, Tom Summers, Imperial Beach. I have uh, a hyphenated word to start with because it was the first thing on my mind and that is non-monopoly. Um, I also have transparent, clean, and empowering. All good. All good words. Awesome. Thank you. Guessing that covers the group unless anyone else wants to chime in. Um, uh, did Anna have... Did you go, Anna? Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, so as part of this process, we'll take this back and, and we'll look at sort of the overall tallies, but I will just say just observationally, heard a lot of community, um, really, really, really great. I love the neighbors um, idea, a lot of transparency, a lot of future focus, um, inclusive was a theme. Um, I'll actually just say we, just so this, this group knows, we did a similar exercise with community power staff a couple of weeks ago and the, the themes that rose to the top for them as well, there are a lot of parallels here. Um, the, the kind of the five that we nailed, on, nailed down were proud, trustworthy, fresh, local, and visionary. And, and local was, a, was a, a kind of a way into community. So I think a lot of the themes that you all brought, whether it's visionary and future focus or community, local, neighborhood focused, um, credibility, trust, uh, those are all themes that are, that are there. So um, I think we can take another look at that list based on your input and maybe um, refine it a little bit, but it's good to know that, that you're seeing things pretty much on the level to our discussions thus far um, with, with community power staff. Does anybody have any questions or observations from hearing everybody else's attributes? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I, I do. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I really like three of those that were obviously mentioned. Uh, generational that Eddie brought up. I thought that one was, was great. Um, optimistic. And then uh, I'll, uh, I don't know if there's a second to a second, uh, Jen uh, supporting Matt's <laughs> comment of good neighbors. I really love that one. Um, so anyways, thank you. Great, thank you. I think we'll skip a couple slides. Do the exercise. Okay, so from a messaging standpoint, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk to this group is just that a lot of you have, have a background in the space and, and, and you have a history to draw on. And, and one thing that's important for us as a marketing group is, um, we don't want to build things from scratch if we already have insights to draw in. 
Um, and we want to make sure that we're we're hearing uh, what's worked and what hasn't worked across a variety of communities when it comes to community choice energy. Um, so there, the next series of slides is just open questions um, and don't feel like everyone has to throw in um, responses to them, but I definitely think, um, I would be shocked if this group didn't have some input <laughs> on your learnings thus far uh, across all these different variables. So um, Sebastian, why don't we click in? So the basic framework of the question is, what, what did the fight uh, for community choice teach us about? So I'm, I'm talking about the past three years. I'm talking about getting to, the, getting to where we are now and, and all, the, all the advocacy that you've done, all the community groups you've joined, um, talking to your friends and family, well, you know, all, everything that you've kind of learned thus far. Um, what did the Fight for Community Choice teach us about, and we'll go to the first one, communicating with the public. What did, what did you learn when it comes to communicating with the public about community choice energy um, throughout this process to get to today? Does anyone have any thoughts? Please. I think when you explain what it is, um, especially in San Diego, when we have one of the highest electricity rates in the U.S., the highest in the state, it becomes a no-brainer. A lot of people I know don't think sdg and &E has been a good partner and they're excited for it. But I think generally speaking, a lot of people have no idea what it is. They don't even know it's happening. Um, I'm from Santa Cruz, which is part of Monterey Bay's Community Trace Energy Program. I'd seen people posting on Facebook, their bill was higher, they were opting out, they didn't know what it was. Um, so I think us being very, very involved, I'm also aware that a typical San Diegan might not be as educated as we think they are, even though we've been doing this for so many years and I've done presentations. Um, so that's just my initial thoughts. Great. What else? Uh, well, uh, we, I was involved in a uh, campaign in North County where we did a website, a Facebook page, and ultimately a, a, a Twitter account. And I think, well, we weren't as successful as I would have liked, and I agree with uh, Tara that there's a lot of people we didn't reach, but I think a, uh, a strong social media presence uh, was successful because there was a lot more awareness of community choice energy in our uh, area up here than uh, when we started. Great. And that, that brings up a good point um, in that when, when we ask these questions, I'm hoping that we can get answers for you specifically in your experience with your community. So don't feel like you need to draw broader conclusions or represent all the five participating cities. Um, the point of this is to really drill down because the truth of it is our messaging is gonna, is gonna shift based on which communities we're speaking to. Um, and we we'll, wanna be cognizant of that. So if there are differences, that something that you found that was really interesting in IB that certainly wouldn't apply in NCS, that's, that's still great. We still, wanna, we still wanna hear that. I know um, uh, Kim, and I haven't I think I've formally introduced Kim Coots. She's, she's my associate at, a, at Civilian and she's scribbling notes furiously because she's tasked with um, not just creating our, our messaging, messaging strategy and our platform, but also she's going to be handling um, so much of our media relations and our, and our PR pitching. So um, she really needs to get immersed in this brand. So um, thanks, Kim. <laughs> um, so let's ask this question again. What did the fight for community choice teach us about communicating with advocates? The next slide. Um, I have a question, and I think it may um, apply to this. Um, because what, what I learned about advocating for community choice was just how um, devilish SDG and E could be, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so my question is, will somebody from civilian be vigilant about communications coming from SDG and E or SEMPRA concerning this? And will there be a, you know, if they come out with something, will we be able to respond with something? Um, as opposed to just acting like it doesn't matter because, you know, once they get something that works, they really go all in on it. Greg, I know you've got something there. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Tara. I just wanted to add to Eddie's, not just SEMPRA or sdg &E, but I think legally it has to be through SEMPRA. Um, but also the groups that sdg and &E and SEMPRA give money to, those are the ones that come out and spread misinformation. So it's not just what the utilities 
um, are saying, but what those groups are that are going to be primarily in communities of concern saying this is bad for you, um, even though it's lowering raise lowering some, you know, has so many good community benefits. Um, those organizations I'm worried about as well. They were just a couple weeks ago um, at the Environment Committee meeting, some of these nonprofits who take money from the utilities and at the city council meeting fighting the environmental injustices that we were trying to stand up against. Yeah, and that's a big focus. And one of the first things that we're getting up and running is what we were calling our truth squad. So absolutely monitoring and correcting. And that's one of the first things we're gonna to get together in terms of an FAQ. And you know, as you see things, we will hopefully see them as quickly and respond, but always feel free to send us stuff to make sure that we're responding. Yeah, and, and I'll add, I mean, you, I don't have to tell you guys, sdg &E has a long, long history in San Diego, and a lot of what they've done here has gotten involved at a very basic community level to all, you know, every organization, they've sponsored everything, and so they have a lot of friends in town. And so, yeah, so that's one of the things that, you know, that we'll all be doing, but, uh, you know, my firm specifically, our role is being out there, being at the Chamber of Commerce, being, you know, being the ears to hear what they're saying in committee meetings and things like that at the Downtown Partnership and the Chamber and, and all those places. Um, and coming back to the group and saying, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we're hearing from, you know, XYZ city council member. Um, we need to come up with a plan of attack to, to fight that. Yeah, because I think it's very important from um, um, Gary's point about being able to communicate with our respective communities, right? Um, a lot of us will be the first ones to be engaged with these conversations in our community. And, you know, I talk a lot of smack, but I like to at least know the smack I'm talking, right? <laughs> Um, otherwise I resort to other solutions. Um, so that's why I kind of asked that question so that I can, you know, be, be as responsive to them because I know they're coming. One of the things that we do as well is we're, we're going to be creating a stakeholder inventory. Um, so sort of breaking down all the voices in the community that may speak up in one direction or another for community power over the next several months as this, as this rolls out. So um, if it's not something that we catch at a community meeting, it might be a Twitter post that because we did the audit and we're following that person, we, we can kind of see things as they're happening in real time. And, and what we'll be doing is working with uh, the staff to, to build a, a proactive strategy so that we know, okay, if it's a comment about these types of issues, don't engage. You know, like we, we, our, our default isn't just to respond to everyone for the sake of responding. So we'll, we'll, we'll really think through um, where, where we want to fight the battles and, and where we want to let them play out. I can ask a question, Sean. I mean, kind of going back to the point of this slide, you know, you all, a lot of you were on the front lines of, you know, getting us all to this point, right? And had to deal with clear the air and, and everything else. You know, when clear the air came out with, you know, whatever messaging they were coming out with, how did you respond or your organization respond? Well, My response is that for public consumption. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to speak to that. Um, uh, we had our website, and it was uh, based on having a blog. And if, if you know, I'll, I'll send you the link uh, uh, through Sebastian, whatever. But we have a whole series of blogs when Clear the Air was doing that, where we had essentially uh, reposting news articles about, you know, the latest disinformation part of the campaign. And uh, there's actually a pretty good little history of just how that all went down. Um, I wanted to make one other point, though, too. Uh, and, you know, Carolyn mentioned on the uh, previous slide, I think it was Carolyn, about uh, there's a lot of an anxiety over uh, jobs because SDG&E is such a big employer. Uh, but I went out with other people to small businesses in our area uh, and we would talk about, well, uh, would you be interested in a program that uh, helps to, uh, you know, control your electricity rates? And basically, you just start talking about that. And almost to a person, uh, it was like SDGV's brand is terrible. 
I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, I know this is counter to what Carolyn said, and I understand the, um, you know, in terms of people that work for SDG and E, uh, there probably is that, um, you know, uh, fealty, but the people we're talking to is like, I couldn't, I was just amazed at how bad SDG and E's brand was. So it seems like there's a two edged sword there. I think there's strength and choice, right? We talked about choice earlier. I mean, I, exactly. I, I loathe Cox because, but they're the, they're the only internet that's coming to my house. <laughs> so, so yeah, if I'm, if I'm given choice, that, that, that unlocks a whole new world for me. So I think that that's a really powerful um, theme to hit. Choice just to, yeah. Just to chime in, I think going back, the word choice was absolutely essential um, throughout our campaign. Um, when I was quite in the same region, it's a keystone word, breaking the monopoly, um, that theme and, and tying that to affordability. At the end of the day, people's pocketbooks were what most resonated in terms of connection. Um, that's, that's the direct link, their monthly bill. And then tied to that, I mean, what pulls very, very well is climate environmental issues. And so you, you bridge the two with the, uh, you know, you have a choice for more affordable rates, and higher renewables, you know, more clean energy, 100% clean energy. The goals, I mean, first of all, that what I think resonated most with the public and it was our entry point with advocates, you know, organizations that were maybe on the sidelines about supporting community choice. Um, and then you can kind of delve into the very specific interest groups for environmental justice organizations, it's ensuring that we're shutting down facilities and pollution that's near them, you know, for small businesses, it's reducing costs for them. Um, for climate advocates, it's getting 100% clean energy. So you find the niche and then you build with the advocates there and they're like, okay, great. This is what community choice can bring. It can bring choice and then it can bring bodies and entities like this CAC <laughs> um, that they can come to and have conversations with uh, versus the other option being a private utility where you're not going to get through the lobby <laughs> to talk about what the opportunities are. So um, yeah, but just going back, I think talking about choice is absolutely critical talking about affordability and then bringing in that climate piece or that, uh, um, you know, presenting your eyes a nice bow um, in terms of how we frame things throughout and helped us counter the Clear the Air campaign and others folks who had a fairly you know, negative opinion. And then I would love a deeper dive conversation with you all offline about that list because I have names <laughs> um, <laughs> that I would like to contribute <laughs> just so that you're aware because uh, a lot of things did come up, especially towards the tail end. I'll absolutely take you up on that. You know, also, I'd like to add, um, you know, I had a lot of people, you know, because I've been in this fight for the CCA for a couple of years, too. Um, and I had people when Clear the Air was out there, you know, running rampant through my community where I had to follow them at their meetings, right? And they'd hate to see me walk in the door. But, you know, they said there's going to be a, a large loss of jobs from SDG and E. And I asked them what jobs, how many, and who? Because we're not, we're, we're, we're just purchasing energy. We're not, you know, we're not just, uh, uh, blowing up sdg and es building in Kearney Mesa. Yeah. They're still going to need those people. When you call for your bill, you're going to have to call sdg and &E. You know, so it, it, it was the truth about the situation, right? Well, you know, everyone's going to lose their job. Okay, who? How many and where? Right, and they could never really answer that. Um, so, you know, part of um, our messaging ought to be the truth, right? You know, this many people may or may not lose their jobs, but if they do lose their jobs, they can go to work over here, right? IBEW five whatever that works for SDG and E um, was talking about losing their job. It's like, no, you're still going to be doing what you do. You're still going to be working on lines and all that kind of stuff. So I think I think some truth in our advertising in our messaging um, will help because they like to lie a lot. I think to add to that, I was at a solar company for almost eight of those years. I was advocating, and we talked about how the solar industry provides a one billion dollar economic benefit to San Diego County. Uh, there are more people employed in solar in San Diego than the utilities. 
and talk about the potential job creation. Just because you have a community choice energy program doesn't mean you're going to see local projects, but the majority of the advocates who fought for this program for so long do want to see local projects. And so I think you can talk, especially now with COVID, it's even more relevant how we can be employing more local um, San Diegans. And to Eddie's point, there was a meeting a couple of weeks ago where it became very much, you are either support the franchise agreement. You either support a 25 to 35 SDG&E, 25 to 35 year franchise agreement in union labor or are you, you're supporting no jobs. And that's not at all what we were talking about. Um, we, I think a lot of us would want to see better jobs, well-paid jobs, better benefits. Um, but that was definitely the messaging and they brought a lot of um, workers out to talk about that, how it's filling jobs. So I think talking about the potential job benefits of local projects um, could help counter that. And for all we know, SDG is listening on this call right now and they're gonna, you know, hear what we're saying and come out, uh, I, I would, I've seen the truth be spun another way. Secretary Webb. Uh, yes, I, I was, um, it's very similar to what Chair Price was talking about, but I would call it educating. Um, you know, the public, uh, they're mushrooms, a lot of them, you know, kept in the dark and fed, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, enlightening the public to a lot of things. For example, both my grandparents, uh, grandfathers were coal miners. Coal's gone. In Southeast Kentucky, the mines are closed. They're just finally scalping off the rest that they can get from strip mining. You know, these coal burning uh, power plants are literally a thing of the past. Now they've gone to fracking and, you know, just trying to eke out the last little bit that they can finally get. And it's very powerful, but it's also going away and people don't know that. I've seen communities, oh, just real quick, where my grandparents lived, and all the men are out of work because all that's there is Walmart, McDonald's, you know, it's a spiral economy. It totally raped them. Their land, their livelihood, everything, gone. So, you know, to me, educating, and maybe not in those words <laughs> because it's a message, but just helping people to understand that change is inevitable regardless of what it is. We're being proactive about it. So there's my little rant. <laughs> and then I see uh, Tom, you have your hand up. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Let's see. There. Yeah, I have to unmute myself too, but that's okay. I'm just on my uh, uh, somewhat smart phone. Um, here in, uh, I'm actually in Tucson right now was delighted uh, somewhat in a, what do you call it, short and proud way uh, about the uh, rolling blackouts in California, because surely that will drive some folks into our way of thinking. Um, anyway, I just wanted to touch on the advocates which are in the industry. I know there's lots of advocates that are uh, nonprofits and you know, other social organizations, but I found there to be uh, an appalling degree of ignorance uh, amongst people who ought to know uh, in the solar and home storage uh, sectors um, about what we're trying to do. And uh, I want to echo some of the earlier comments about how we address that and um, also, um, dipping our toe into that uh, lowest common denominator of, of social media, the book of faces, um, you know, we just, we just have to get more information out. One of the things that I have encountered uh, numerous times in my conversations in my, my circles is uh, a, a mistrust and, and basically comes back to me in the form of uh, words. Uh, yeah, but you're still gonna be using their grid. You're still gonna be using their wires. 
you know so so i think some people uh, suspect that we are in bed with uh the monopoly and uh certainly um, they mistrust them because of all of the largesse that they spread around the community and especially um, within our own um, city councils. And, and uh, so, yeah, communicating with advocates is key, getting this message, some of my thoughts, and uh, thank you. Love that. Thank you. Um, I want to be mindful, I, I, Sebastian. I know that we're, we're we're taking up a lot of time. I'm I'm soaking up every second of this. So if if, if it's okay for us to keep going, um, I'd love to keep the keep that long. We have, we have I think three more slides. That sounds good. Um, okay, great. As long as it's good with Chair Price, it's good with me. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Cool. I'll try to make sure that we 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 move forward efficiently here. Um, so. Let's talk about electeds. Let's talk about leadership. Um, what what did the, the the journey to today teach us about communicating with that group? <laughs> oh, I thought I was on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if I may, on this one, because I did quite a bit of had quite a number of conversations with elected officials. Um, <clears throat> I'd say it, it there 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 is a lot of bipartisan support for community choice. You can take different angles. Um, the makeup of the current SDCP board, I think, is reflective of that. Um, if you're a hardcore uh, uh, progressive or if you're someone with more conservative leadings, you can find a reason why, you know, competition in the energy market is important or why it's important to achieve 100% clean energy with a public utility. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity <coughs> uh, to push back and build a lot of Republican so support. Um, I think that was we had a Republican mayor in San Diego that did that. So I think the opportunity is there. It's just a matter of just, you know, curtailing it per situation. And I think that'll be vitally important as we look towards expansion to other cities in the region. Great. I agree with Matthew. This shouldn't be like a liberal program. Um, Lancaster has been a perfect example for solar we've used for years and years. Um, Republican mayor and they had some great solar initiatives. Now, obviously, there's a lot of operational community choice energy programs to turn to as well. Um, you're asking us about history. I think early on, Vashti knows this as well, a lot of some elected officials were fearful of speaking out against SDG&E um, and some organizations who take money from SDG&E didn't speak out. And I think as the two paths became clearer, because initially it was can SDG and E come up with a proposal? San Diego has a climate action plan. We need to get 100% clean energy. How do we do that? Do we do it with SDG and E? Do we do it with community choice energy? So a lot of us were advocating for community choice energy. It became clearer and clearer. SDG and E's proposal was not something that was being um, truly considered. There wasn't enough details. It wasn't a viable pathway. And as that became clearer and clearer, more organizations and more elected officials did start championing community choice energy, but a lot of elected officials take money from SDG and E. They're running for re-election, whether it's for the same position, for a higher position. And so we've seen elected officials silenced by um, fear of not getting money from the utilities. And so um, we luckily had one clear pathway and got a lot more people on, support, on board, a lot more organizations on board, um, but that is with elected officials, it is something we have seen that some people would be fearful about speaking out, unfortunately. Yep. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, we, we've touched on this as we've gone through the process, but the, the, last, the last iteration of this question is um, opposition messaging. So what, did, what, have we, what have we kind of learned about that? And I've heard really great things about having you know, having the myth buster, having, having the simple answers, having the, the enlightenment and education responses to the known messaging that's gonna come. Any other insights come to mind about um, whether it's the tone of the opposition messaging or tactics that they had used, just things that you picked up that um, you think is, is worth talking about here? Yeah, in my humble opinion, they'd be lying. Just <laughs> out and out, just uncut, no chaser, just lying. And that, that you know, speaks to my comment earlier about we just need to tell the truth. 
I think you also had a comment about asking the asking the follow up question to, to, right. to, to chisel into that, right? Right. I, I said it earlier, I think that the, the billing was what I was seeing previously with um, clear there and beyond that the city can't bill for water. Why, how can they bill for electricity? Um, and just putting lies and fear into people that, and as we haven't discussed, but I'm sure you've been informed, um, SUD is changing over their billing early next year that coincides with when we're switching to this program. I don't know if that's coincidental or not, but um, that is something that will, if people then have higher bills at the same time, they're gonna blame the program. And so trying to combat message, this messaging, um, I think is key. Okay. Um, I just, I wanna make one comment about that. Uh, you, you know, going back to the Clear the Air uh, campaign, um, that they took kind of a hard line and uh, that guy Erdison that ran ran the campaign, uh, you know, he was kind of like Darth Vader. And I, I think they discovered that that didn't work because all of us, there was a time around the 1st of 2018 where part of the art campaign was just gone. And so I think we're looking at, you know, more subtle messaging, more, you know, happy, happy talk and maybe just hints, hints of uh, some of these, uh, some of these fear campaigns. In other words, the fear campaign is, is like a subtext in a more positive messaging because I think they, they learned something from uh, Clear the Air campaign and the way it did not work. At the franchise meeting a couple weeks ago, they the people that were speaking out kept talking about SDG and e being a good partner. And then as Eddie and I mentioned jobs as well. Um, so I would assume that's messaging they'll continue to use if there is a campaign against us. I think another important piece of this is, is not just the message itself, but also who, who deploys the message. Um, you know, my, my understanding from what I've read so, thus far on clear the air is just, it was very individual based. There were, there were specific, voices that were very loud in pushing that, that particular message. And I think for moving forward for this coalition, the broader group we can get, the more people, I mean, we're, we definitely want to have spokespeople, you know, giving out the message, there's no question, but the broader that we can arm the community at large with this information, um, it just, you're, you're going against an army if, you, if, you're, if you're a loud voice. And, you know, yeah, you know, what, what I found was, was I found interesting was, who were the people and organizations that got compromised by SDG and E, right? Um, and I think to your point, um, broadening the message and who to broaden the message to, right? There were a lot of um, um, religious entities in my community that got compromised. But there's a lot more religious entities in my community. So delivering a message to 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 churches and you know what it'll do for the members and what it'll do for their church and the benefits of the program, um, I think would be beneficial. I, I've always thought it'd be interesting to see b both campaign contributions as well as if it's if you can find out those organizations who have spoken out, say it's a pastor. How much money did the, is that public information? How much money did their church take from SDG &E? and have that be part of the information? Like who opposes it? This is, these are the people who oppose it. This is what like they are bought off, uh, and just disclose that because if that's the, if those are their, you know, the only people that are advocating for it, and you can show that it's clearly a self-serving interest that doesn't serve their community members, then it uh, kind of takes away the power from them. Great. We also have that benefit of being on the right side of this. So that's always a gap, right? Um, why don't we go? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Little, yeah, I think you have to be a little careful about that and uh, get that information, but maybe feed it to the press rather than, you know, have it part of our messaging directly. Yeah, Gary, you're in my head. Um, <laughs> yeah, we want to be the adult in the room. I, I, 
I get the sen sentiment and I, I feel your anger through the screen. Tara. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, and we'll know, and there's ways to find all that out and, and there are ways to funnel that information, but we want to, I think we want to stay the adult in the room and let other people carry that message. I also wanted to make a, a comment about where the message comes from and even cycle back to the electeds. Because when, when we noticed the opposition message coming, uh, we went to our sustainability commission and made them aware. We started writing and handing out pamphlets ourselves. But, um, but I, I feel I'm recycling back and I'm thinking, okay, um, we need to really go back to the electeds now because some of them still, you know, we're still working with them and establishing relationships. And I think the relationships are really important for what's going to happen with the rollout. And so we're going to be taking back messages to um, some people that still aren't completely enthusiastic. So that's, I think that's going to be a really important place because we know in our community, there are a few people that really have a, you know, they have a big influence. And so I think that's, we may even need a different type of messaging for those groups that we want to talk to, like the people that are influencing other people. That's a, that's a great insight. And that's one of the things on our plate is to start that conversation with, with city staffs and with the elected class. So that's, that's well taken, for sure. Um, why don't we go to the, the next slide. So this next exercise, and, and, I, and please don't feel like you need to repeat what we've talked about before just because it's phrased up in a different way, but um, a lot of what we try to do in behavior change mm -hmm. and, and marketing is, is shifting perceptions. Um, you know, what is a current perception that is not what we want, but where, where, what's the optimized version, the desired version of that perception? Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, what is the community perception of community choice energy right now? That may be nothing. There, there, there may be no perception because there's no awareness of it. And the desired perception would be all the, all the brand attributes that we spoke about earlier. You know, it's, it's a, it's a community-based, transparent, credible energy provider that's going to get us to our climate action goals. Like, you know, like they, so what is the desired version of that? Um, so I'm curious if anybody has any, any, any thoughts to offer as to what's a current perception related to either SDCP as an entity or community choice energy in general that we want to shift and get to a higher ground? Um, if I may, you know, and, and this kind of relates to the last um, slide. One thing that, that, that um, they were doing was, was playing with our intelligence, right? Oh, this is too complicated. It's complicated. You know, every time I ask them to explain something, oh, it's complicated, Eddie. It, 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 don't worry about it. It's just not a good thing. Um, and what I found for my satisfaction is I don't need to know what the board of this needs to know, right? And what our general counsel needs to know, that may be complicated. But for the end user like myself and, and, and everybody in the community, it's very simple. It's very simple. Um, and the truth is very simple, right? We will get cleaner energy and it has the potential to be less expensive. And the longer we do it and the more we do it, it gets even less and less expensive, right? For the end user. Um, so all that complicated conversation that they tried to convolute the community with, um, like they're, you know, geniuses or something. Um, I think that's the perception that they were trying to elude to that this is complicated and can't nobody do it but them, right? Um, and the desired perception is, it's not that complicated, and this is actually a beautiful thing for not just us, but our grandchildren and their grandchildren. You know, the corollary to sort of uh, uncomplicated, perhaps, or at least as I've spoken with folks, the perception is specifically a CCA in San Diego, San Diego Community Power, as an unknown. Yes, there's the potential, the opportunity, but at this stage, it's simply an unknown. Will it deliver? on sustainability or uh, accelerated access towards uh, renewables? Will it deliver on, uh, on actual cost savings for consumers? 
will it deliver on the potential to include communities and orient programs that are truer to community needs um, um, with communities uh, at the side. So there's a lot of opportunity. I don't know if it's complicated per se, but it's simply a perception of uh, it's unknown at this stage. Um, if I can add to that, uh, uh, just to tag along the, the complicated piece, and, and I know this is something that, that we've talked in depth uh, with, with you guys, with uh, Civilian and 360, um, is, is the, the aspect that the energy industry is complex, but in my opinion, community choice is, is meant to untangle some of, some of that and make it more transparent so people can understand a little bit better to, to bring in, you know, to have these types of meetings uh, where we can all weigh in. Um, and so, so anyways, I, I know we've had those conversations, but I thought it'd be good to, to bring that up again. Um, I'm gonna speak from a place of not having been in this fight for the you know past two, three, five, seven years, and thank you to all those who have, but in my current and recent conversations just with my own community members, a lot of it is the, it, it's unknown. It's not something anyone's ever heard about before. Um, so that would be just the perspective and the conversations I'm having in my community. And we can, we can, we can overcome that with simplicity arguments, but also I think success stories. Somebody brought that up earlier. On today about how, just how many CCAs there are out there, how much they're, how much clean energy they're generating in the state, how much, um, you know, cost savings, everything like that. Also, one other side note on that is the is the perception that, um, you know, cities and governments shouldn't be involved in something like this. They know nothing about it, and what, what how can they run this? So that would be another perception I've, I've heard. I've heard that. I've heard that perception. Um, people also remind me of uh, the Enron debacle and uh, the deregulation debacle of a generation ago. I think uh, when it comes to complicated, um, the monopoly sets the standard for complications just by virtue of their billing. And um, since they're going to be doing billing for us, I would hope that we have some um, ability to make it simpler for the, um, for the folks that stay in uh, so that they won't opt out because um, uh, anybody who's ever tried to look at their bill um, knows what complicated is all about. That's all I got. I think another one um, that came up several times in the call so far is just the perception that this is some ultra progressive leftist, you know, environmentally pushed. Like it, it's it, 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 the idea that community choice energy doesn't have any uh, rational benefits. It's only it's it's only progressive and leftist benefits. Right. We want to get past that so we can broaden our net for. Uh, do you want things, Sean? Um, I don't think we've brought this up, and I don't know if, if your team is aware. Uh, one of our board members, Bill Baber from La Mesa, he's Republican, and so uh, again, just adding to the to the argument. And he, but he's a really he's a really reasonable. I mean, and Jen, I'm sure you've met Bill. I mean, he's a he's a he's a reasonable person who makes hopefully private decisions. So okay. Right, I think we've I think we've squeezed a lot of creative juice out of this group. I'm feeling, I'm feeling it, <laughs> feeling the drag. You all contributed so much. Thank you again for the for the conversation and thanks for for teaching us some things on this call. Um, you know, if you have any any follow up questions or any thoughts that pop into your head, you know, like like after you finish, you know, get in an argument with your spouse, you recognize, oh, I, I had that one thing I should have said um, that really would have nailed it for me. So uh, feel free to pass those along through Sebastian. Um, we, we, we'll take all comers with information. Um, in terms of next steps, I think we put a slide in there, Sebastian, for it. It actually is, things are changing pretty quickly here, but um, we do want to come back to you uh, once we've done some of this initial research and we've got kind of some of our, our consumer and community baselines set. Um, so I don't know if it's going to be October. It might be the November or December timeframe just because we're shifting around our research schedule so that we don't get caught in the noise of election season and trying to get people to 
you know, answer a survey while they're being bugged by, by pollers all over the place, pollsters. So, um, but we are working on a messaging uh, platform and uh, we're also working on the, um, the guidelines document uh, for right. community yeah. messaging. Um, and then toward the end of the year, we're going to have uh, a set of collateral and toolkits and, you know, fact sheets and FAQ documents and the types of materials that you can take and have at your ready for whenever you do engage with your, uh, with your communities. So um, again, we're, we're really pumped to be part of this. Thanks for, thanks for letting us in. Thanks for all you do. Um, any other thoughts or questions before we, we kick it back to, to Chair Price and Sebastian? Yeah, I, I have one thought. Um, it, it, it may be beneficial if you actually communicate to each city's representative individually, right? Because we all have our own idiosyncrasies um, and some may be the same, but some may be different um, so that you get a better grasp of, you know, what I deal with in the city of San Diego and what they deal with in the city of Encinitas, right? There, there's, there's similar issues, but there's some different issues also. I think it's great. That may be beneficial while you're, you know, doing that downtime during the election. That's great. We can, we can have a deep dive, um, individual yeah. interviews on that. And, and if everyone's game for that, we'd love, we'd love to do it. I'm glad that we got a little bit of rapport on this call, so it won't be out of nowhere. So, yeah, happy to. Any other questions for the gentleman or Sean, you got anything else to say? Thank you. Okay. For the rest of your day. Sorry, sorry we ran over. It was good information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, now we're on agenda item number nine, provide input and direction on a prospective, inclusive, and sustainable workforce policy. Woo! I'm glad I drank my coffee before I got on this call. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, discuss uh, the purpose of, of, of this item. Uh, and then we do have a uh, public comment, um, which I will uh, show after, um, if that's okay. Uh, I, I know Cody's also on the line, so Cody, if I miss anything, uh, please chime in. Um, so uh, the basic premise for today uh, is a little bit more listening uh, from you all. Uh, I understand that it's uh, we've gotten a little bit over, and and it is a Friday. Um, uh, but please note that you will have a second opportunity to review this document. Uh, so, so basically, what we have right here is an outline of uh, what will become our inclusive and sustainable uh, workforce policy for SCCP. Um, staff's intent is to gather any input you have today uh, and then come back next month on September 11th um, uh, when we have our next meeting uh, with uh, a more full draft of the document uh, for, your, for your review. So. So please take that into consideration. I understand, again, uh, uh, we've gotten a little bit over. Um, I did send this over on Monday, uh, so I hope all of you have had an opportunity to, to review it. Um, uh, but if not, uh, it, it is broken down into three steps, as you can see on the screen. Let me know if you all want me to zoom in a little bit more. Um, we have an inclusive workforce section uh, with four bullet points, uh, one for SCCP, SCCP staff, supply chain, inclusive business practices, and a non-discrimination pledge. Um, and we have a sustainable workforce section. Uh, and this one goes into uh, PPAs, uh, SCCP own generation, feeding tariffs, energy efficiency uh, slash programs, and, and union neutrality. And then our last section, um, uh, pretty straightforward, it's reporting on, on the two items above. Um, and what we've also included uh, as part of your agenda package for today are the policies of Peninsula Clean Energy and uh, Marin Clean Energy. Um, in addition, we also included SCCP's own procurement policy because uh, those policies already support uh, some of what we're trying to flesh out right here. So, so for example, one of them is our non-discrimination pledge. 
um, that will that's already been adopted by our uh, uh, procurement policy, uh, but it would just be added here um, uh, uh, given its significance. So um, at, at this point, Chair, would you like me to uh, read over the uh, public comments submitted? Yes, please. Okay, let me stop sharing the screen because I gotta uh, go to the... Excel sheet I have. Okay. Uh, so, so the public comment today was submitted as a comment, um, uh, but do not wish to speak. Uh, and this comment is from Ma Micah Matroski, uh, environmental organizer with IBW 569. Uh, the comment reads as follows. Uh, dear members of the Community Advisory Committee, um, IBW 569 supports the general policy framework of the Peninsula, Energy, Peninsula Clean Energy Inclusive and Sustainable Workforce Policy revised October 25th, 2018 in the staff report. We recommend additional job quality and labor standard provisions for one, STCP owned generation projects, two, SCCP heating tariff projects, and three, SCCP energy efficiency projects. We also recommend including the union neutrality pledge to read, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, SCCP will remain neutral regarding whether its employees choose to join or support labor unions and will not interfere with decisions by its contractors and suppliers employees about whether to join or support labor unions. Thank you for your work and consideration. And that concludes the public comment submitted. Let me reshare. Give me one second. Share. Okay. Uh, so at this point, if anyone has any suggestions, uh, staff will uh, take into consideration, uh, and as I mentioned, bring uh, forward a full draft uh, uh, next month. Thank you. Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? I, I have just a small procedural one. Uh, the item on feed-in tariffs just seems like it's not worded like any of the others, and it just tries to refer to the uh, the opening uh, paragraph. Uh, it, you know, I, I would consider that, uh, as far as documentation, a little uh, not well organized. I mean, it, I don't think it, uh, um, you know, precludes anything, but, um, I, I just don't like the way it's uh, not like the other bullet items in that section. That, that's good feedback. Th thank you, Gary. Um, well, to me, uh, when I look at that. Jen, Jen had a comment. Um, well, I was talking as Anna. Okay, Anna, I'm sorry. Uh, Anna. That's okay. No, that's all right. Um, I was just going to say, you know, what, with what Gary said, um, but it does explain that it will be updated in the future once the programs develop. And also the feed and tariffs, the one below it, says the same thing. So possibly it's because we don't have full description yet of what that looks like. So I'm okay. I mean, I'm personally okay with that. Just saying. Yeah, it, I stand corrected. The uh, the the next bullet down also energy efficiency programs is is kind of the same, uh, you know, deviation from uh, the more specificity in the other bullets. The, um, that's that's great feedback. Thank you both. Um, I agree. It could have been worded a little bit better, but uh, uh, as you both uh, uh, read, um, uh, so for example. Uh, uh, PEA will be bringing in a feeding tariff presentation uh, to the board 
uh, next Thursday uh, to introduce the topic and then later on develop the program. Um, and so once those programs are, are developed, um, then we would uh, work with you all to, to shape it as, as it's coming uh, into fruition. So uh, uh, these are more placeholders, uh, but, but point taken, uh, thank you. And so I have a question. Um, because this looks like it leans toward union only stuff, right? Just prevailing wage, union labor and apprenticeship programs. Is this mandating that the San Diego Community Power utilizes union labor, prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs? Uh, so, so this is, yeah, yeah, so, so this is sample wordage uh, for you all. Um, the program hasn't been developed, uh, so it could go either way. Um, so again, this is just that. Well, this, this doesn't look to me like it's going either way. It looks like it's going one way. Got it, okay. Well, there is the last bullet about union neutrality. Got it. Yeah. It, again, we're we're taking feedback from you all, um, so uh, I'm all ears. <laughs> yeah, well, that last bullet about union neutrality is just about the employees, basically, of SDCP, whether or not they can or can't join a union or create a union. But that, you know, really doesn't have anything to do with the the workforce policy. Okay. As far as PPAs and own generations energy efficient programs and, and all that. Okay, got it. Um, so I, I, I do the neutrality section. I think that's important. Um, just to give people that ability and that option. Right. Um, I think the closer we can get to Peninsula, the better, uh, since it is the standard bearer. I think my biggest concern um, is just making sure that we're being inclusive in our workforce hiring practices so that all communities of concern have access to the green economy. So, um, you know, building a pipeline is absolutely critical. And I think that uh, there's been a needle for a lot of important conversations between equity groups and labor groups and other organizations have done. And so um, I just, I'm hoping that there can be more of those conversations um, so that there's less consternation when these types of policies move forward. Um, because again, it's just absolutely critical that our most vulnerable populations that are on the front lines of the climate crisis and who desperately need access to good paying jobs um, are able to reach that and have that opportunity. Um, so I think that would be a very important focus for me. Okay, thank you. And so let, let, let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. Does the term union labor have to be in there? It's up to you all. Because as soon as, as, soon as we put that term in there, union labor, and, and to some extent project labor agreements, that um, eliminates everybody else. And to the you know the, the communities that that uh, Matthew was talking about, this looks like you know you're going to use union labor. That's Does what that? it said. Okay. Use the local skilled and trained workforce, fair and open competition, prevailing wage, local businesses, union labor. Okay. So all that stuff before union labor sounds real good and is open to fair competition. But as soon as you put union labor in there, it, it signifies what it is. Okay, got it. And then there's another question is, is like on PPAs, it says promote, employ local. But it doesn't say will promote, can promote, shall promote, may promote. And that, that word before promote is very, very, very important. 
um, as we look at these things. Got it. A question? Yeah. So Sebastian, this is a, uh, a policy for SDCP. So its own board of directors will ultimately take in feedback and decide what to adopt. Is that correct? That's correct. So, so as part of the process, um, uh, we're, we're gathering feedback from you all um, to put together a draft that will come back uh, next month. Uh, and that will serve as uh, the recommendation of the CAC. All of you, uh, I imagine we would want to uh, vote for you all to recommend uh, the draft that you decide on uh, next month uh, for, uh, for the board or, or if we decide to go to another committee, um, the Finance and Risk Management Committee. Uh, so, so yeah, a, a lot of input. But at this point, you're soliciting overall comment. So all, mm -hmm. any and all perspective and feedback can be provided to the board. SDCP is a JPA, a Joint Powers Authority. Although it's own, its own separate entity, it is a JPA. I, I don't know, but I just wondered to the extent whether the participating joint cities have their own policy requirements in terms of their participation in programs, projects, and otherwise that require consideration of those own municipality. Um, preferences and policies and, and requirements. So if a city says, you know, this is, is if we don't have this, we don't participate. I don't know, um, but I'm just wondering if we might be able to get some feedback on the degree to which, you know, this is all intertwined, uh, perhaps. That, that's a great point. We, we have regular uh, uh, meetings with member city staff and we can def definitely, definitely bring this up. Uh, to them to, to make sure we cover that. Thank you, Ed. Okay, thanks. Would it be appropriate to Mr. Lopez's concern that at our next meeting, those different city staff come in and address how they feel about this? You know, like a two minutes or five minutes or four minutes specifically to this so we get a better, because that is a good point, so we get a better idea of what the other member cities feel about this. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a nice suggestion. I, I, I couldn't care. I, I have no preference one way or the other. I don't know if it you know, makes it workable during a, a meeting. I think it, I would start with at least our own staff trying to collect and obtain that type of feedback and then presenting it to us and some particular city participants very felt felt very strongly about directly expressing their considerations and requirements, that's, that's fine. Um, that, that does bring up a good point though, because I know here um, being on, working on the mayor's task force um, for coronavirus that um, they were extremely concerned with the, um, the um, um, ADA, and uh, the Disabilities Act and, and how things were presented and worded uh, because of that. So uh, that is an excellent point that I would be on board with because the cities, we want the cities to, to, be, to support this. That's great feedback. Um, I will uh, take that in and, and chat with Cody uh, on that. Uh, the other thing is, of course, um, your, your own board members are representatives of the cities, uh, so, so they'll get a chance to review this um, and, and see if it makes sense for them. Um, but, but overall, thank you. I appreciate it. Any other feedback? Um, I was trying to find in the um, in, in the procurement document, and I can't find it. But I thought there was something in there to address the uh, you know uh, differences between cities, where they say if any of these policies are uh, inconsistent with city policies, that uh, 
the most stri the most stringent of the requirements are to be in effect, but I can't seem to find it. I, maybe it wasn't a, di a different document. It might have been in the uh, Peninsula one. Um, we we attach the SCCP procurement policy um, to this agenda packet, uh, but but so, sorry, I, I don't understand uh, your question too well. Do, do you mind rephrasing it? Okay, uh, there was the question before, uh, I believe Eddie raised about if uh, are the are these policies the same as, or will there be some conflict with city policies? And so could we have, you know, cities, uh, the individual city staffs? Yeah. And um, I read, <laughs> I read through a lot of this and, and but did, I don't remember where I saw it, but somewhere in here, there was a statement about, uh, you know, and I'll just use generally the word policy. If these policies, if there's a discrepancy between the policies in this document and that of the individual cities, that the policy of the most stringent requirements would be the one that would be in effect. But I can't find it. So, um, gotcha. Gotcha. It, I understand. It, it seems it sounds like a reasonable way to address, uh, you know a kind of potential conflict between city policies and SDCP policies. Gotcha, that, that, that makes total sense. Uh, we will take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any more questions, comments, or concerns about um, uh, item nine? Okay, are we good, Sebastian? We're good. Uh, thank you all. Um, we'll come back next month. Thank you. All right, let me go back to the um, next Number 10, does anybody have, or should we discuss potential agenda items for the board of directors meeting? Um, I don't have anything in particular. Is there anybody else on the uh, committee that has one way or the other? Okay, so I guess we move on from there. Are there, number 11, are there any committee announce, committee member announcements? Uh, I would just like to announce that I'm curious as to who the SDCP CEO may be. I haven't heard anything about it. Maybe I'm out of the news cycle. I thought it was it was to be decided by now. Me also. Sebastian, you have any update on that? Uh, I don't have an update, unfortunately. Um, I do know we're, we're trying to uh, finalize that uh, very soon because, uh, as you all know, we are uh, delayed on that. Uh, as soon as I know something, uh, I will be sure to let you all know. My, under, well, is my a, understanding is there a timeline? Is there a timeline? Is there a, uh, have they narrowed it down to 15 people or two people or five people? Um, um, is there a timeline for the answer to this? I, I know that um, th there's going to be a closed session uh, before our regular meeting next Thursday. And uh, the item is to uh, uh, hopefully finalize this. Uh, again, I've, I haven't been part of, of those discussions. That's been uh, General Counsel and, uh, and Chair Mosca. Um, but again, I, as soon as I know a little bit more of the timeline, then I, I will be sure uh, to share that with you all. It's my it's my understanding it'll be discussed in a close. They've narrowed it down to a couple of candidates, and it, they'll finalize it on Thursday in a closed door session. Um, it was last I heard about two weeks ago. So you say that to say there will be an answer next Friday. My understanding was they would be voting on it on the twenty seventh, and we should have an answer that day. Um, but I that I lost heard two weeks ago. I don't know if that is. True. I hope not. 
Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, th that close item will be to discuss that. Um, uh, but regarding next steps, uh, that's that's where I I don't know. I wish I knew more. Um, but again, to reiterate, once I do, I will be sure to let you all know. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and item number twelve. If nobody has anything else, I'd like to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and thank you for staying on uh, a little bit longer. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Great weekend, everyone. Good session. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Happy birthday, Eddie. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Happy birthday, Eddie. <laughs> Bye. That's 321.